This episode of In an Instant is powered by Wasabi. Get 15% off camera batteries with promo code INSTANT. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my hecking frick. I think I, think I just saved Polaroid Spectra. He didn't. Now the story of a bumbling photographer who thought he saved Spectra and the tool he actually used, which kind of works. This is In an Instant. The kind of photography that would become part of the human being. Press a button and have the picture. I know what you're thinking. What a clickbait title. I thought you were better than that, Benny Bag of Lies. What kind of two-bit swashbuckling shuckster have you become? I thought I respected you, man. Now I'm like really not sure if I do still. Well, I'll explain it in a second. Welcome to In An Instant, my name is Ben, and today I'm talking about a very bizarre method of adapting the lens of the SX-70 to produce wide field Polaroids that almost kind of look like the discontinued Polaroid Spectra format. And they're not, I know that. Um, I don't mean to spark a debate or even bring the word Spectra back into the conversation, but the first time I laid my eyes on one of these strange polymorphic images, I couldn't help but see the resemblance. Let's dive right in to how it's done. What we're doing here is essentially placing an anamorphic lens in front of the SX-70's native lens to create an optical Frankenstein I call polymorphic images. We're gonna discuss how to assemble the kit, what the results look like, and what methods you can use to significantly improve the usability of this bizarre Polaroid rig. I was up at 2 a.m. one morning and I had an idea which I absolutely should never have. Uh, I thought, okay, so I have the SX-37 adapter, which clicks onto the front of the SX-70 for small accessory lenses, link in the description of where to get one. I've used it for things like fisheye lenses and filter lenses, but what if I screwed an anamorphic lens onto it? What, what, what would even happen if I did that? Anamorphic lenses are a unique tool used almost exclusively in cinematography that squeeze light as it enters the camera, creating a compressed image that has to be de-squeezed either in post-production or projection. The purpose of anamorphic lenses is to capture a wide cinema aspect ratio using the entire frame's resolution instead of having to film from a wider initial perspective and crop in post, losing image information and resolution. Because of the inherent differences between oblong anamorphic lenses and traditional spherical lenses, grain and lens flares also look quite different, giving those elements a unique look that J.J. Abrams famously overdosed on and was rushed to an area hospital where he was deemed untreatable. Our heart goes out to his family. I have used anamorphics in filmmaking, but I was always really interested in trying it for 35 millimeter photography. It's such a unique way to capture two, three, nine to one wide still images. But anamorphic lenses are very heavy, they're very large, and very expensive. Uh, with something so cumbersome, it'd be a real beefer to haul around for some simple fun. Though, uh, given the fact that I routinely carry the Mammoth RB67 around, I don't really know what my hang-up is. Regardless, this brings us back to trying to use one of these anamorphic lenses on the SX-70. I had a lot of initial questions. Do they even make anamorphic lenses small enough for the 37 millimeter thread mount? If they did, would it cover the image area of the SX-70? Um, aren't people making anamorphic adapters for phone camera cinematography? These are my questions, people. And so I went online. Uh, this was also at 2 a.m. And I couldn't easily locate an anamorphic lens with a screw mount that would work on the SX-70 adapter, which has a titular 37 millimeter thread mount. What I did find was a small economy of mobile phone anamorphic lenses that looked just big enough to fit over the SX-70 lens. It ultimately went with a small rig 1.55X filmmaking lens that actually does not have a thread at all. It's meant for magnetic mounting. At 1.5X squeeze, it isn't quite the 2X mega wide anamorphic look we know and love from the movies, but it was good enough to get started. I proceeded to glue the damn thing to the SX-37. In my first version of this, I used a 37 millimeter to 43 millimeter step up ring that I adhered to the small rig lens, which could then be screwed onto the SX-37. But I really wanted the anamorphic lens as close to the SX-70's lens as possible, since we're really stretching the capability of this thing and the closer it is, the better. Uh, a phone sensor is minuscule compared to the larger than medium format scale of a Polaroid, so it wasn't intended whatsoever to optically handle this amount of coverage. Uh, it's also squeezing onto a square image rather than a 16-9 image it was intended for, but with the SX-70 lens being quite small, we're given a fighting chance to try it anyway. 
The image that comes out of the camera when you use this setup is, as I discussed, squeezed, distorted, though definitely recognizable, uh, and then requires de-squeezing in post. Now, this may inherently violate some people's idea of physical Polaroids as a standalone final image, so it's not for everyone. But in post, the image is de-squeezed to reveal this wide aspect ratio Polaroid, a polymorphic frame. And these final de-squeezeronies are violently close to the aspect ratio of Polaroid spectra images, clocking in at only a few millimeters wider. My first few attempts at this were quite underexposed, and while shooting with Polaroid goat Brett Bretty Brettlington into the Polaroid Watkins, he smartly noted that there would be a loss of light reaching the film as it has to pass through a substantial lens element here. Going forward, I started shooting the Polamorphics with at least one full stop of overexposure, if not a little more, and the results improved greatly. What is unavoidable, however, is the drastic distortion, aberrations, and vignetting. As I mentioned, we're stressing this lens far beyond the image circle it was intended for, and thus there is radical smearing along the edges of the frame. Yes, you're technically gaining a wider image, but at the expense of any clarity whatsoever beyond the center of frames. This is of course bad, but it's also a creative opportunity to utilize this look to your advantage. I found the lens produced far more interesting and usable images with the main subject at the center of the frame or only slightly offset, and then using those distorted edges for out of focus areas where it's much less noticeable. This is the frame that really set me on the right path. First, I took a wide shot and it was terribly smeary, but then I got up close and just let the aberrations contribute to the bokeh, now creating a really interesting look in my opinion, one I can actually use for creative frames. I look at this setup as kind of like a V1 of what is possible with polymorphic pictures. While anamorphic lenses intended for SLRs and mirrorless cameras are still very pricey and a ridiculous investment to be used with a Polaroid, uh, they'd surely provide much cleaner results as they're intended for use with much larger sensors and 35 millimeter motion picture film. And as indie filmmakers continue to spring out of the primordial soup, more and more anamorphic solutions hit the open market at increasingly competitive price points. So who knows, V2 could be coming soon. But for now, we'll have to enjoy the lo-fi polymorphic look as it stands. But we'll assuredly be doing more experimenting in the future. So did we bring back Polaroid Spectra here? I don't know. Maybe I'm a hero. Um, if I'm a big time hero, let me know in the comments. If I'm a big time villain for the title of this video, also destroy me in the comments. Keep it locked and thank you for watching in an instant. Go ahead and 2X stretch that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more guides, breakdowns, reviews, and all things instant. Bye.